it's important that you know how to run your business. It's important that you know how to ask intelligent questions to the people who work uh, with you and for you. So all of your advisors from legal to financial to operations, no matter who is advising you in your business, it's important to engage with them enough that you can get good advice. It's important to stay with the numbers piece enough that you uh, can uh, have a certain level of control over your own business because it's dangerous to cede too much authority and um, too much control over your finances, especially in your business, to anybody who isn't you. I don't care who they are. Hey, it's Samantha Hartley with the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. This is the last episode of season 13. We've been talking about gifts and talents, skills and expertise. And I feel like it would be incomplete for us to cover all of the things that we've talked about without also uh, addressing weaknesses. Like what about the opposite of gifts, talents and skills and expertise? What about when we're not in our strengths? What about those, uh, those weaknesses, those places where we don't feel like we're amazing and 100%? And what do we do about those uh, in our work and in, in our lives as consultants? Uh, do I admit those things to the client? Do I bring those things forward? And can I market myself as a complete package if I feel like I'm lacking in certain areas? And what if you're like on the newer part of your career uh, and you feel like I haven't yet developed all the things that I feel like all the other consultants have? Or what if you're uh, near the end of your career on the contrary and you feel like, gosh, Am I like old, outdated, losing my edge, like whatever, right? So all of us feel at times some of these things. We feel these weaknesses. So I want to talk about a couple of things. I want to talk about uh, weaknesses and then vulnerability, the difference between those two and how you can use and um, have a relationship to both of those in your consulting business and how you can remain um, in your power and, and your expertise, uh, keeping both of those in mind. So the first thing I want to talk about are weaknesses because it's just so easy for us to say, let's just ignore them, right? Uh, let's just go big with all of the strengths and all of the other things and just like pretend like I don't have uh, these certain things. So we can look up at at any aspect of them, uh, the things that uh, the things that I'm not good at, for example, uh, in SWOT analysis, what we uh, generally did, in my experience, was that external things were called threats, but things that were true of you and not likely to change were what we called weaknesses, right? So, for example, if you're um, a, a factory that has a certain location, like you're not going to move your factory, probably. Uh, that's a big endeavor, a major business decision. So right now, while we're here, what do we do about that? So that's just an example. And I tend to think of weaknesses are things that are true of you and unlikely to change. Now, I'm so growth oriented that it's impossible for me to accept that anything about us might be unlikely to change. But, you know, like my eyes are brown. Uh, I'm five feet four. Like those are things that are unlikely to change. <laughs> uh, so let's think about other qualities of yourself as a consultant that are not likely to change. So uh, I don't have an MBA. Could I get an MBA? And by the way, it's but never come up as a big issue. Could I get an MBA? Sure, I could at great expense. So let's just take, for example, the fact that I don't have one as uh, as a quality. And what do I want to do about that? Well, the, uh, as I mentioned, the first thing that I could do is, you know, I can change it. We all have the power to change things. If that had been a major priority for me in my career, if I had noticed that I was constantly being put in situations where it was like, well, if I only had an MBA, everything would be better, then I probably would have pursued one uh, and done something about that. You can similarly think about any qualities you have. I've uh, I spoke in the uh, certification episode about do you need to go and get certified in something? You know, you do if you do, and you don't if it never comes up. Uh, so one way to address our weaknesses is that we can do something about it. And for goodness sake, don't complain a long time about it. Like figure out what you're going to change and get into action around it. So that's really the first thing that we can do with something that we perceive as a weakness uh, that's a competitive disadvantage, for example, you know, something really like that, or that is maybe bothering us personally, feels out of integrity, whatever. The second thing that we can do with weaknesses is that we can reframe them. And this is what I tend to do as a marketer when I come in and I work with an organization. And now when I work with individual consultants or consultancies, it's like, here's what's true of us. Um, 
you know, let's reframe this as a positive. How is this thing either net neutral or a positive thing? So for example, I have some clients who are small consultancy. There's five of them. Maybe there's more now, but um, anyway, uh, they're all remote. So what if there was uh, every other organization was regarding them, the fact that they were remote as a negative thing? Or what if the organization itself felt like, wow, the fact that we're all remote, we just are limited in the things that we can come together and do. Okay, so that's uh, that's the kind of thing where I'm going to say, let's figure out how do we how do we call that something positive? I have other consultants that I work with, and you know, a lot of us are focused on working with corporations. And so I have clients who don't come from a corporate background and feel like, can I still work with you? And can I still go and sell my stuff to organizations, even though I'm not from a corporate background myself? Well, not necessarily, but if you choose to to go into corporations, then we need to figure out how to position the fact that you aren't from corporate as an advantage. Now, I personally think not being from corporate is a great advantage because you don't have all of the, you know, in the box um, specific known paradigm thinking that people who came out of corporate have. Some people are going to consider that a disadvantage that you don't speak the language and you don't know the stuff. Trust me, I always say you can learn all that stuff really quickly. And what you can't do is easily unlearn a lot of that corporate nonsense that was um, uh drilled into our heads. So not from a corporate background, let's position you as, hey, um, you know, an outsider who can um, come and, you know, show you the better way to do things or whatever. My favorite example of somebody positioning a, a perceived weakness as a strength. There was this guy that I worked with back at Coke, and he was in this argument between, uh, he was representing a, a major territory, and he was in an argument with the head of research for the whole entire company. So uh, they're going back and forth at it. And this was a very, very smart guy. Uh, so the head of research was starting to get really frustrated was because he was kind of losing all the arguments. And what he finally said to the younger guy was, listen, well, you just don't have the experience that I have. Uh, you just don't know enough about it. And um, my buddy goes, yeah, I'm not burdened by your experience. And so what I'm able to see is dot, dot, dot. I'm not burdened by your experience. Like what an amazing way to take that guy's strength in an argument and his own uh, perceived weakness in the argument and to totally flip it on, flip it on its head. I mean, that guy's head exploded, by the way. <laughs> the other guy was just like, oh my God, I can't believe you had the nerve to say that to me. How dare you pretend that your lack of experience means you're not locked in to systems thinking and you know known paradigms and all that. So just keep in mind that you can always reframe anything that is true about yourself. And we can creatively come up with a way in which it really is an advantage. The last thing that we can do with our weaknesses is, uh, you know, we can just accept them. Listen, this is the way that it is. I am, um, you know, I have brown eyes. I'm five foot four. Um, I'm the age that I am, which let's not get into that. And, uh, like, this is what's true. Like, this is who I am. And I think for a lot of us, the, um, the more we accept who we are and the more we say, oh, okay, fine. Like if you choose to go with another alternative, that's fine. This is who I am. Uh, I, I don't have the MBA. I don't have the whatever and really accept yourself and then uh, take what you are and how you are and market that as strengths. The tiny caveat that I want to add before we move on from weaknesses is there are a few weaknesses that I think are critical and I don't want you to reframe them. And one of the weaknesses is that uh, a lot of consultants I see are um, lacking in the fundamentals, like not great at all of the business ownership parts of owning a business. Uh, you can delegate some of that stuff, uh, but it's really important that certain things you do know how to do. You need to be better with the numbers if, if, if you're not good with them at all. And all of us, by the way, no matter how good we are, usually could always afford to be better with them. It's important that you know how to run your business. It's important that you know how to ask intelligent questions to the people who work uh, with you and for you. So all of your advisors from legal to financial to operations, no matter who is advising you in your business, it's important to engage with them enough that you can get good advice. It's important to stay with the numbers piece enough that you uh, can uh, have a certain level of control over your own business because it's dangerous to cede too much authority and um, too much control over your finances, especially in your business to anybody who isn't you. I don't care who they are. So it's really a uh, key for you to have 
a, a certain level of fluency in that. So that's really the only thing that I ask my clients, like force yourself. I know I hate that language, but really force yourself to get better at the business piece as a minimum level of competency. And then everything else, it's okay to delegate and to um, do whatever you need to. Okay. Next season, particularly uh, the, the theme for the, uh, the next season is money. We're just going to full on go into it because uh, it's the most important area of competency outside of your own uh, like gift and expertise. You have to be able to uh, earn money in the business, be fluent with money, uh, understand pricing, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, even if you're going to have an advisor come in and help you with it, I always want you to have a certain, just a minimum basic level of literacy, ideally fluency and control. Okay. Uh, and I probably won't make or force you to do anything else uh, in any other aspect of your business than that you take care of yourself. Cool. Okay, so that's weaknesses. Now, what is interesting is that for years, many of us conflated, meaning we thought the same thing of weaknesses and vulnerability, especially for those of us who like to be in our power. I am, I love to be in my power. And when I was young and immature and growing up as a manager, I very much exerted power over others. So I was put in charge of people. I was like, here's how I know how to manage. It was what was modeled to me by everybody. I was like, this is what powerful people do. And so I was like, uh, bossy. Uh, I now know the language for this command and control style of leadership. I was more of a command and, um, you know, laissez-faire kind of leadership. Like, I, I'm going to tell you two things. I expect you to go and do it. Oh, you didn't do it. Uh, come here and I'm going to, you know, scold you or whatever. So it was very kind of like immature form of power. Uh, this is my uh, early to mid twenties, immature form of power, uh, kind of modeled after an immature vision of parenting, not even the way I was parented. Um, uh, it was how a lot of bosses uh, uh, were to me. And I also, a lot of my leadership, I learned through the theater. And if you know anything about theater, it's very tyrannical in uh, certain spheres. And so kind of that model of, you know, just being, uh, I don't know, like a loose, crazy, creative canon is, uh, is the way that I learned to, um, to lead and to manage. Well, thank goodness I grew out of that, but that's the beginning of my relationship to um, authority was to be that way. So that is an immature form of power. The immature form of power is power over others. When we become into a more mature form of power, it is power over self. So this is a concept that I learned from Carolyn Mace and her works. Uh, Mace, M-Y-S-S, -S, Carolyn, uh, Carolyn Mace. Uh, so she talks about this concept, power over self. That is really intriguing. Once you realize, oh, I don't want to dominate other people. I want to figure out how do I get the best out of others by getting it through myself. I model this for others and I can also um, I can also elicit from them the things I want by uh, through self-mastery, right? Through self-leadership. So that to me is a more exciting opportunity. It's also the more evolved opportunity. It's now, you know, um, years later since I was that young manager. And I remember e even within my own business, this pivotal moment when I had someone working for me and I was like, well, he's not doing this and he's not doing that. Well, what are my options? I was like, well, I could fire him in a fit of rage. And I thought, well, that won't help me. Cause then I won't have like, I need that, uh, role. I need that person to do that work. So hmm, that form of control wouldn't work for me. Well, I was like, what's my next option? I was like, well, I could yell. Okay, well, will that get me what I want? No. Well, what can I do? Pun it. So I had all these, I was uh, cycling through these punishing options or these command and control options, these immature power over options. And then I was like, well, this person doesn't have to work for me. They choose to work for me. And I want them to work for me and I want this to work out. So what do I need to do to get them to do what I want them to do? And I was like, well, let me figure out a way to communicate that. And suddenly I evolved myself into a more mature form of communication. I would say leadership and management of a person who worked with me. I didn't, I wouldn't even say for me, right? But I, nobody works for me. Everybody chooses to work with me on my team. Um, 
because they don't have to. They can all leave at a moment's notice, which I think uh, after the pandemic, we realized it's kind of true of almost everyone. Like a lot of people don't have to be working for the places they're working. And if they get abused, they like, they can go somewhere else. So uh, that was really my journey towards realizing that power over others is not strength. It's a form of um, weak uh, power. It's immature power. And I wanted mature power. And I wanted to work with other people who wanted to work that way. So I don't scold or threaten anybody in my work because it doesn't work. And uh, I'm, you know, one of my huge values is effectiveness. And if something isn't effective, I just stop doing it. Uh, so this isn't to say I'm so dick, I'm enlightened. It's like, Hey, here's my, my, my journey to learning this, which was super rocky, uh, and, uh, embarrassingly immature at points. And now, uh, I just, I just do it differently. And so I want to teach others to do things differently. Not that I'm su- suggesting that you're, um, immature in your approach, but I'm just sharing that this is, this is how I learned these things. The other thing that I learned was a lot about vulnerability. So vulnus, I have to look down just to make sure I'm getting the the Latin right. Vulnus is the root word of vulnerability. And it's the Latin root word means to wound. Vulnus, to wound. So vulnerability literally means wound ability. The ability to be wounded. I learned that from um, our late spiritual director, uh, Jim Curtin, who taught this concept about wound ability. And it means, you know, we can't be armored all the time, uh, that when we have to allow ourselves, um, to be wounded and when we are wounded, it hurts. And uh, that's how we develop like emotional resilience a lot of times. And obviously Brene Brown has talked way more than, uh, and way more expertly than I ever will about uh, the topic of vulnerability, but the way I experience it in my own business and the way I have, have experienced it is that the more willing I was to be vulnerable with my own clients, the more incredible the connection uh, we attained and the results that everyone got. I and they, everyone got better results. So for me to, to share uh, like my management journey from power over others to power over myself is a, a, a vulnerable moment that I share in the hopes that it will um, maybe expose some things for you and give you ideas, uh, remind you of things in your own life. Uh, and also I hope that it creates credibility that you know that I'm not only sharing like the beautiful parts of my journey. Uh, as an Enneagram three, it's uh, it's a quality of our types to really want uh, to, to care about image and to make sure everything looks like successful, which is, it sounds like everybody on Instagram, right? We all want to share like the beautiful parts of our journey and things like that. And so sometimes somebody will share vulnerable moments and in my experience, when I have done, it's been amazing. So I have shared uh, my stories of um, the revenue roller coaster, how <laughs> terrifying it was to have a month, a forty thousand dollar month, followed by a seven hundred dollar month. I've shared how frustrating it is for me when things don't work in my own business, and um, it makes me livid <laughs> because I don't like to what my husband calls to struggle in my area of mastery. So when I do something in marketing and it doesn't work, it makes me really, really mad. Even though what I will also teach, because I also know with another part of my body (laughs) that my part of me gets really mad. And the other part of me knows that marketing is just a great big experimentation and um, things, sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And really things work way less often than they don't. And I've shared how I discovered my inner child and how that helped me to learn play, to be playful at work, to um, access more creativity, to uh, find this voice, this incredible voice that I really never had since the original time that I knew her when she was seven. Like there were years that went by in between where I was kind of coming into understanding her. And one last thing I will share is that I was recently in Egypt and I went there for uh, my husband's bucket list. And I also went there with my mother and our best friend to explore, uh, you know, I wanted to be um, an Egyptologist when I was 12 years old. So I really went there to explore 
so much more than just this place of tourism. And we had such a deep spiritual experience there and physical and cultural and emotional. Like it was such a big experience that it's been a month that I've been processing that and it like scrambled my insides. And so I've really had to rest, process, uh, dream, discuss with my um, travel companions in order to be able to come back to work and function again. Like it was a lot. And I think it was a lot because we need to have these powerful experiences to help us reset our priorities. So um, a lot of times we just return to the place that we were before with a deeper understanding of that place, which I think is, I think I said just, but um, I, I think is what happened. Like, yes, I am, I am where I want to be. I am where I choose to be. And I do want to do this. And I, I, like many of us, I, I yearn for more balance in this. And um, I also choose to do those things which connect me to you, my audience, because I'm called like literally by the universe in meditation and prayer. I am told uh, what I'm to be doing and what I'm to share, such as what I'm sharing today. So this is like my work to do. Uh, and that's, I think that's what I want you to take away from this season is balancing these strengths and, um, and talents and gifts and expertise. I'm going to tell you one key, uh, well, actually two keys about vulnerability. We have to use discernment with it, right? Brene will talk about the difference between like being vulnerable and then oversharing. So what you choose to share uh, how you choose to share it and when you choose to share it. Like those are really critical things. So um, I'm intentional with what I'm sharing and it's very often something that I'm either I've processed or I'm, I'm, I've processed enough that it's, it's not raw and it's not uh, let's say credibility um, eroding. Like it's not going to scare my clients to hear me saying, Oh, that's what she's working on. Like, yikes, we really need somebody who has their act together around that, for example. So we do need to use discernment with uh, vulnerability, what you share, when you share it. The second thing is that vulnerability works in sharing it works only to the extent that you also step into and claim your expertise, stand in your power, know your strengths, claim your expertise, like fight people for it. Okay. Stand up for yourself, own your gifts. Like that piece is critical for you to be able to have the privilege of sharing the vulnerability. Both of these are required, I believe, to make you the most effective version of yourself that you can be as a consultant for yourself and your business and for and with your clients. So own your gifts, stand in them. And then when you feel the calling to share something that you feel like this is going to help my clients to understand me better, to understand the process and the work better, and to have more self-compassion, then that's the thing that you can share. Cool. So with that, I'm wrapping up this season, season 13. It's been such a pleasure to share these concepts with you and to hear from you. I would love to hear through all of the socials. What's your Enneagram? Have you taken the disc? What are your gifts that you claim and own and will arm wrestle someone for uh, for uh, the right to do them for your clients? I want to hear, do you choose certification? Do you have an MBA? I'm really just super curious about you. And I am always excited to hear um, from you on any of the social channels or uh, by email. So you know where to find me by now. If you would like my assistance in helping you to transform your consulting business into something bigger and better than you ever thought it would be, you already know now a little bit about the way that I work. Uh, it's going to be uh, a certain percentage of frameworks and a certain percentage of spiritual and personal development, depending on where you are on the journey. Uh, so get in touch about that. And with that, I am wishing you a profitable and joyful consulting business. 
Thanks for watching. I'd appreciate if you'd like this episode. And if you enjoyed the show, why not subscribe? Be sure to click the bell to get notified when new episodes drop.